All right. Get down. All right, we've made it to the last video in this module. In this video, we'll be going over how to run and interpret two-way repeated measures, ANOVAs in SPSS. Our research scenario is somewhat similar to our one-way repeated measures ANOVA example. So our research was interested in discovering whether a short-term, two-week, high-intensity training program significantly changes a marker of heart disease called C-reactive protein, or CRP, as we will abbreviate it in the remainder of the video. So I've highlighted our independent variable, or at least one of our independent variables in yellow, and our dependent variable in green. The researcher recruited 12 participants and had them perform two trials, a control trial and an intervention trial. So this is identified as one of our independent variables, um, which is essentially going to give us the measurement of exercise or the difference of exercise compared to no exercise. As we can see, this is a within subject uh, independent variable because people are performing both trials, okay? And it has two levels, the control trial and the intervention trial. There was sufficient time between trials to allow for residual effects to dissipate. CRP concentration was measured three times, at the beginning, midway, and at the end of the trials. So this is going to be our second in, uh, within subject independent variable that has three levels. We could identify this as time of measurement or time. Um, again, the three levels being the beginning, midway, and end of the trials. Subjects continued their normal activities for the control trial. During the intervention trial, subjects exercised intensely for 45 minutes each day. So that's how the two um, trials are different from each other. Again, we identified two levels of the treatment or exercise intervention, being the control group or CON, which is how we will abbreviate control group in the next uh, slides. And then intervention um, was the other group or the exercise group, and we'll abbreviate that as INT. There were three levels of time, pre-intervention, mid-intervention, and post-intervention. These time points will be noted as one two, and three. Again, our dependent variable was CRP concentration. So when we outline all of this information into a little flowchart, we can see that our treatment independent variable has two levels, and our time variable has three levels. Again, both of these are within subject independent variables. And when we are trying to decide what type of test we're running, or if we're labeling this as a two-way ANOVA, which we know it is, we have to have two primary components, the number of independent variables, which we could list as two-way or um, level by level, so two by three or three by two. The order in this particular instance doesn't matter. And then we also need information about the types of samples that were used. So this could be uh, referenced as within, within, within representing the type of independent variables that we've collected, or we could refer to it as repeated measures or RM um, as an abbreviation. If you put any of these four components together, we end up with a series of naming conventions, any of which would be perfectly acceptable um, to name the, the test. When we put our data into SPSS, we are going to end up with six variables, okay, because we had two trials, so the, the intervention of the exercise trial and then the control trial, and then each, each subject performed both of those, and then each subject also was measured three times in each of those trials, the pre, the mid, and the post measurements. So that gives us a total of six measurements per subject. Each measurement is going to be stuck into a column. Columns are associated with variables. So because we have 
a measurement that we've collected for each of our columns representing a measure for each subject. All of our measures need to be listed as scale. This is what it would look like in our data view. Again, each row represents one subject and each subject should have a total of six measurements listed. Now we can go over the task list or kind of the process that we're going to go through in order to run and analyze our uh, two-way repeated measures ANOVA. Similar to last week, let's assume that we have a normal distribution and no significant outliers for the dependent variable for all of our groups. The first step that we're going to go through is setting up the test. So to get to the test, once you have your data set up, you go to Analyze, General Linear Model, and Repeated Measures. This repeated measures will actually house our two-way repeated measures ANOVA, which we're doing today our one-way repeated measures ANOVA, and then we'll also conduct our uh, mixed factor ANOVA, um, or two-way mixed factor ANOVA in this uh, section as well. So the repeated measures test is quite the versatile test uh, that we can use to run a various number of different ANOVAs. Once we choose to run that test, we will have this dialog box pop up that asks us to define our factors. So in this top box, you're going to identify kind of just a general label for each of your independent variables. So I put in treatment. There are two levels of treatment, the control and the intervention. Once you've inserted your general name and the number of variables, you click Add, and that will put it down into this box here. Since we have two independent variables, I did the same thing for time, noting that we had three levels of that uh, independent variable. And then under Measure Name, I added CRP, which is my dependent variable of interest. So once I've got this window set up appropriately, I can click Define, and then that will bring me to the main repeated measures analysis dialog box. In here, we can see my six variables. So I've got my um, intervention groups and my control groups or my control trials and the three measurements that were taken at each time point. Over here, we can see treatment. So in parentheses, we have treatment, comma, time. This is the naming convention that will be used for these numbers here. So treatment, we had said, had two levels. And you'll notice that the numbers that span this first column are 1 and 2. It's kind of up to you how you define what 1 and 2 are. So from here, um, we also have time, right? And we said there were three levels of time, so we have 1, 2, 3, 1, 2, 3. We can then input all of our data into here. Again, you, you have to keep track of how you're labeling your uh, levels. So. In the example that I was given on the Laird Statistics website, they chose to input their variables. Whoops. They chose to input their input their variables as the intervention group as label one and the control group as label two. From here we can click on the EM means button, and that will give us our estimated marginal means dialog box where we can input our independent variables and the interaction into the display means for box. We'll check the compare main effects and choose a Bonferroni adjustment. So very similar to how we set up our post hoc tests last week. We then click continue. That'll take us back to the repeated measures uh, dialog box. And then we can choose the options button uh, to decide which calculations we want to include in our analysis. So descriptive statistics and estimates of effect size are going to be the only two that we check. Some of you might be thinking about homogeneity tests. We don't need them this week because we don't have a between subject variable. So once you have these two 
uh, boxes checked, you can click continue. That'll take you back to the repeated measures dialog box. And then at the bottom of that box, you'll click the paste button to open a syntax window. Now, when this pops up, it'll be very similar to how we had it for our two-way independent ANOVA, where you'll have the EM means for one independent variable, EM means for the second independent variable, and then the EM means for treatment times time or the interaction effect, but there won't be anything after that. So we're adding in the compare treatment with a Bonferroni adjustment and then copying that line and doing compare time also with a Bonferroni adjustment. Once we have our syntax set up, we can then click on run, select all, and that will generate the output. So now we've got our test set up, the next step would be to check our assumptions in Motchley's test. Motchley's test looks at sphericity, and you'll notice in Motchley's table, we've got each of our within subject factors as well as our interaction effect. These are our Motchley's statistics. And then our p-values are noted in this sig column here. And from our lecture video, I told you there was kind of this epsilon area where we have different uh, possible adjustments that we can make if we end up violating sphericity. So a big point is that we have to check sphericity for each of the main effects or also the interaction effect. We'll start with our treatment row because that's the first one. And you'll notice that there is no p-value. You might remember from the lecture uh, from part one that I had mentioned when you only have two levels of an independent variable and you stick it into um, a two-way ANOVA, Motley's test will return a value that represents perfect sphericity. So in this case, we would just assume that because there are only two levels of treatment, We'll accept the null hypothesis, which states that the variances of the differences between our treatment trials are equal. Since we have met sphericity, that will indicate that we need to read the sphericity assumed row for treatment in the ANOVA table. Then we can check the p-value for Motley's test for time, which we can note as p is equal to 0 0.027, that's less than 0.05, so we know we have to reject the null hypothesis. Again, the null hypothesis for Motchley's test is that these variances of the differences between time points are equal, and our interpretation, because we reject the null, we would end up saying that the variances of the differences are not equal. Because we have violated sphericity, this would be an example of when we have to utilize the epsilon area of our table. So we direct our attention to the epsilon value in the greenhouse geyser box. This value is 0.661, which is less than or equal to 0.75. When we have this specific criteria, we know we need to use the greenhouse geyser adjustment when we read our main effect in our ANOVA table. If, however, we had a um, greenhouse geyser epsilon value of greater than 0.75, so the value in this box greater than 0.75, we would then use the hewn felt adjustment in our ANOVA table. So again, because we had a, a greenhouse geyser epsilon value less than or equal to 0.75, that tells us we are going to use the greenhouse geyser row for time in the ANOVA table. The last thing we have to check in our sphericity table is if a sphericity was assumed for our interaction between treatment and time. So we can find our p-value on our table and we notice it's 0 0.072, which is greater than 0 0.05. So that means we would accept the null hypothesis and argue that the variances of the differences between treatment trials for each time point are equal. 
Since we have met sphericity, that means we read the sphericity assumed row for the treatment um, time interaction in the ANOVA table. So all of this was checking assumptions. The next portion of our analysis is interpreting the ANOVA results. We'll start by looking at the main effect of independent variable A, which we identified as treatment. Before we do that, though, I just want to give you an idea of what the full ANOVA table looked like in the output. Um, I had to cut or crop uh, the, this photo so that I could include everything on the slides. But just as a refresher based off of our Motchley's test results, we had noted that we assume sphericity for our treatment independent variable. We needed to use the greenhouse geyser for our time independent variable. And then we had assumed sphericity for our interaction effect. So these will be the rows that we read for each of our main effects. Again, we'll start with main effect A, which is treatment. So in our uh, test of within subjects effects, that's our ANOVA table. We can see we have our sphericity assumed row, which lines up with a p-value of 0 0.002. This is less than 0.05, so that means we reject the null hypothesis. The null states that exercise intervention has no significant effect on CRP concentration, regardless of when CRP concentrations were collected. So again, um, as a repeat or review refresher of last week, we have two treatment groups that um, are just going to be compared, like all of our uh, control dependent variable measurements and all of our intervention measurements. So all of those get combined into one. So we should end up with, I think we had 12 subjects. So we should have 36 values being averaged for the control group 36 values being averaged for the intervention group, and then we compare those two means together to find the main effect of treatment. So since we had a p-value less than 0.05, we end up interpreting that p-value as the control and intervention trials have significantly different CRP concentrations regardless of when the CRP concentrations were collected. Also, another thing to note, since we have a significant main effect, that means we need to run post-hoc tests for treatment. The next thing we can do is look at the main effect of independent variable B, which we identified as time. So again, note the table has been cropped to fit on the slide. Our p-value, we said, was going to be under the greenhouse geyser adjustment which we can see is less than 0 0.001, which is less than 0 0.05. So we reject the null hypothesis, and we would argue that there is at least one significant difference in CRP concentrations between time points, regardless of the intervention trial being performed. Now, my interpretations, I'm varying them throughout the um, examples in here, so you have multiple uh, references to how you might be able to write your interpretations. We have another scenario where our p-value or our main effect was significant, so we also need to run post hoc tests for time. The last uh, main effect that we're looking at in our ANOVA is the interaction effect. So this will be treatment times time. And we had noted before that we assumed sphericity for our interaction. So we read the p-value in that row, which is less than 0 0.001, which is less than 0 0.05. So we reject the null hypothesis and argue that we have a significant interaction effect between exercise, intervention, and time. Again, since we have a significant interaction effect, or main effect, if you will, we do need to look at post hoc tests. So to summarize everything, um, since we have significant main effects, we need to look at pairwise comparisons or post hoc tests. And I've outlined um, the main effects 
and the uh, interaction effect combinations that we need to look at since each of these had p-values less than 0.05. We can start with our uh, pairwise comparisons for independent variable A treatment. We can see in our pairwise comparisons table that we have a p-value of 0.002 for the mean difference between our intervention group, which we listed as number one, and our control group, which we listed as number two. Now, if you're like, wait, how did you get one and two? If we skip back to our test setup, uh, let's do this one. We had noted that the numbers in here represent the first level of treatment, and the numbers down here represent the second level of treatment. And when we inserted our variables, we had noted that the intervention group was level 1, while the control group was level 2. So that's how I got those numbers. Now I have to find the pairwise comparison slide again. <laughs> Oops, not quite there yet. There we go. Okay. So we have a p-value of 0 0.002, which is less than 0 0.05, so that would mean we have a significant pair or a significant difference between our treatment groups. A way that you could word this interpretation is that CRP concentrations in the control trial were significantly different from the intervention trial, regardless of when CRP concentration was measured during the interventions. Okay, because again, this is for the main effect of treatment, when we are not considering any of the time points. I do want to note that the pairwise comparisons are technically not needed when we have two levels of an independent variable. So if we cross-checked the p-value of our pairwise comparisons with the p-value in our test of within subjects effects ANOVA table, we would end up seeing that the p-value is exactly the same because we are comparing the same means to each other. So now we've got that one out of the way, then we can check our pairwise comparisons for independent variable B, which we identified as our time points. So time point one is the pre-intervention, time point two is midway or mid-intervention, and time point three is our post-intervention. Our p-values are listed in the sig column, and I have highlighted the significant pairs, not including the redundancies that you see in the gray background color. So we could list our pairs as um, significantly different for all pairs. So you could say all pairs are significantly different. I've noted uh, the pairs individually, just so you can uh, understand the differences in the numbers if that isn't linking with what they are associated with. So pre is significantly different from the mid-intervention measurement with the p-value of 0 0.004. That's this one here. The difference between our pre-intervention and post-intervention had a p-value less than 0 0.001. And the difference between our mid-intervention and post-intervention had a significant difference with the p-value of 0 0.003. So we could interpret this as all time points resulted in significantly different CRP concentrations regardless of the intervention trial being performed. Because when we collected our, um, or when we found the p-value for our time variable, we just said everybody who had the pre-measurement doesn't matter if they're in the control group or the intervention group, we're going to mush them together and we get a mean value. And then we mush everybody at time point two and we mush everybody at time point three. We now have three means, we can compare those means, and then we get results. So these are just the pairwise results of that comparison. We've got our two main effects, or we've got the pairwise comparisons for our two main effects analyzed. Now we can look at the interaction effects, first by looking at our treatment 
for comparisons of our treatments within the levels of our time points. So in the syntax, this would be identified as compare treatment. And we get a table that looks like this. So we have comparisons of our intervention trial with our control trial within the pre-measurement group or pre-intervention group, mid-intervention and post-intervention. Again, I've highlighted the significant p-values in yellow, not including the redundancies. So we can see that our significant pairs are between the intervention and control group for the mid-intervention time point, not ones here. And then we also have a significant pair of intervention and control group for uh, our post-intervention time. So an interpretation might be worded like, CRP concentrations in the control trial were significantly different from the intervention trial for the mid-intervention and post-intervention measurements only. Again, we're excluding the non-significant pairs in this interpretation um, because the p-value was greater than 0.05 for the pre-intervention uh, measurements. The last thing we have to check in our pairwise comparisons is the uh, kind of comparisons of different time points within the levels of our treatment groups. We can see in our pairwise comparisons table that I have highlighted three significant pairs the first one is between our pre and mid intervention measurements for our intervention trial or where people got exercise. Our second significant pair is between the pre and post intervention measurements, also in the intervention trial. And our last significant pair is between our mid and post intervention measurements, also within our intervention trial. So we might interpret this as there are significant differences in CRP concentration for all time points in the intervention trial, but no significant pairs in the control trial. Since again, control was labeled as two in our treatment uh, categories and it didn't have any significant p-values. So now that we've run our post hoc test, the last thing we have to do is look at the effect size of the differences. So again, we'll do partial eta squared for our two-way ANOVAs. Um, I don't remember if I mentioned this last time, but partial eta squared can be interpreted very similarly to like an R squared value for a covariance or a coefficient of determination for regressions. So um, really this value represents a percentage of variance that could be attributed to the particular effect um, that we're investigating. So again, our interpretations are that anything 0.1 or kind of close to 0.1 is considered a small effect size anything around 0.6 is medium, and anything around or greater than 0.14 would be considered large. So we can see that we have a partial eta squared effect size of 0.604 for our treatment main effect. Again, I'm within the test of within subjects effects uh, table, or my main ANOVA table, to find the effect sizes of my main effects. Okay, so treatment had 0.604. This is larger than 0.14, so that means we have a large effect size for the differences between our control and intervention trials. The other uh, in, uh, effect size that we have is for our main effect of time. And we have a value or partial eta squared of 0.699, which again would be considered large. When we look for the effect sizes for our significant pairs, or for this example, I just went ahead and noted all of the effect sizes for the um, interaction effect pairwise comparisons. So instead of a univariate test, uh, like we had for our two-way independent ANOVA, 
we use a multivariate test table for the interaction um, for our repeated measures ANOVA. So it's still located right below the pairwise comparisons table, so the flow of how you read your output is still very similar. You'll notice that there are a lot of different ways that the effect size has been calculated, um, but all of the values are the same. So I just go with the first one. There are, in fact, differences between each of these methods, but that's kind of beyond the scope of this class. So we could list our first p-value um, under time point 1. Again, this is for comparisons of treatments within each time point. So the way that we would interpret this is that uh, 1 is associated with our pre-intervention measurement. There's an effect size of 0 0.035, which is closer to 0 0.01 than it is to 0 0.06 give or take. So in situations like this, if you guys put small or medium or small to medium effect size, you're kind of in the ballpark, so it would be correct. But I argued that we have a small effect size for differences between treatment trials for the pre-intervention measurement. Don't forget when you do your interpretation to make sure that you note that you're looking between treatment trials, so that's the pairwise comparisons table that we're at within the time point that you're looking at the effect size in. Our next uh, effect size value is under our mid-intervention group or mid-intervention measurement and that was 0.487. Because this is larger than 0.14 we could we would consider this a large effect size for differences between treatment trials for the mid-intervention measurement. Our last effect size is uh, 0.745 for the post-intervention measurement. And again, our interpretation would be something like there is a large effect size for differences between treatment trials for the post-intervention measurement. That takes care of one set of our pairwise comparisons for effect sizes. Then we can look at the other one, where we were comparing time points within each uh, treatment group or within each treatment trial. We can see in our pairwise comparisons table that I have highlighted three significant pairs. The first one is between our pre and mid intervention measurements for our intervention trial or where people got exercise. Our second significant pair is between the pre and post intervention measurements also in the intervention trial. And our last significant pair is between our mid and post intervention measurements also within our intervention trial. So we might interpret this as there are significant differences in CRP concentration for all time points in the intervention trial, but no significant pairs in the control trial. Since again, control was labeled as two in our treatment, uh, categories and it didn't have any significant p-values. So now that we've run our post hoc tests, the last thing we have to do is look at the effect size of the differences. So again, we'll do partial eta squared for our two-way ANOVAs. Um, I don't remember if I mentioned this last time, but Partial eta squared can be interpreted very similarly to like an R squared value for a covariance or a coefficient of determination for regressions. So um, really this value represents a percentage of variance that could be attributed to the particular effect um, that we're investigating. So again, our interpretations are that anything 0.1 we're kind of close to 0.1 is considered a small effect size, anything around 0.6 is medium, and anything around or greater than 0.14 would be considered large. So we can see that we have a partial eta squared effect size of 0.604 for our treatment main effect. Again, I'm within the test of within subjects effects uh, table, 
for my main ANOVA table to find the effect sizes of my main effects. Okay, so treatment had 0 0.604. This is larger than 0.14, so that means we have a large effect size for the differences between our control and intervention trials. The other uh, in, uh, effect size that we have is for our main effect of time. And we have a value or partial eta squared of 0.699, which again would be considered large. When we look for the effect sizes for our significant pairs, or for this example, I just went ahead and noted all of the effect sizes for the um, interaction effect pairwise comparisons. So instead of a univariate test, uh, like we had for our two-way independent ANOVA, we use a multivariate test table for the interaction um, for our repeated measures ANOVA. So it's still located right below the pairwise comparisons table, so the flow of how you read your output is still very similar. You'll notice that there are a lot of different ways that the effect size has been calculated, um, but all of the values are the same. So I just go with the first one. There are, in fact, differences between each of these methods, but that's kind of beyond the scope of this class. So we could list our first p-value um, under time point one. Again, this is for comparisons of treatments within each time point. So the way that we would interpret this is that uh, one is associated with our pre-intervention measurement. There's an effect size of 0 0.035, which is closer to 0 0.01 than it is to 0 0.06, give or take. So in situations like this, if you guys put small or medium or small to medium effect size, you're kind of in the ballpark, so it would be correct. But I argued that we have a small effect size for differences between treatment trials for the pre-intervention measurement. Don't forget when you do your interpretation to make sure that you note that you're looking between treatment trials, so that's the pairwise comparisons table that we're at, within the time point that you're looking at the effect size in. Our next uh, effect size value is under our mid-intervention group or mid-intervention measurement and that was 0.487. Because this is larger than 0.14, we, could, we would consider this a large effect size for differences between treatment trials for the mid-intervention measurement. Our last effect size is uh, 0.745 for the post-intervention measurement. And again, our interpretation would be something like there is a large effect size for differences between treatment trials for the post-intervention measurement. That takes care of one set of our pairwise comparisons for effect sizes. Then we can look at the other one. When we consult our partial eta squared column, we see an effect size of 0 0.820 within our intervention trial. So that would be interpreted as a large effect size for differences between time points in the intervention trial. The other effect size is for our control trial, um, or within our control trial, and was listed as 0 0.084. So 0 0.08 kind of lands closer to 0 0.06 than it does the 0.14. So we could argue this is closer to a medium effect size for differences between time points in our control trial. So again, the order of operations, you set up your test, check your assumptions, check the results of your main effects in your ANOVA. Any significant effects require that you look at post hoc tests. Any significant post hoc tests are going to specify where the significant differences are within each of your groups. Then you look at effect size for the activity. I'll keep this as kind of honing in on um, the effect sizes of only the significant pairs. 
The examples that I did for this PowerPoint, I did all of the effect sizes. So when you're doing your activity, just pay close attention to which pairs you listed as significant and only report the effect sizes for those. All right, that concludes all of our lecture videos for this week. And um, I will probably virtually see you in the activity videos.